Hello viewers, uh, today we will be speaking about Adrian Rich's poem in a classroom. Uh, the main objective of this lesson will be to explicate the main uh, themes and ideas in the poem. Uh, we will also be looking at uh, Rich's use of the image or the space of the classroom itself. Uh, we will also be studying this poem in the context of other such classroom poems, poems which use the classroom space. Now, uh, Rich's poem in a classroom presents the reader with uh, the iconic image of the classroom. It is iconic in the sense that it is generally associated with uh, the ideas of education, learning, as also knowledge. And the poem begins uh, by giving you an image of a teacher who is weighed down by the books that she is hauling to the classroom. The teacher is referred to as hauling an armful of books to the classroom. Uh, she is speaking about poetry to a classroom full of students. Uh, these students are engaged in activities that are commonly seen uh, in a classroom. Uh, they are uh, variously engaged in reading, talking aloud, uh, they gaze up and down. Uh, they are also unraveling the language of the text uh, that they are studying. None of them is uh, aware of uh, any existence uh, outside of the classroom, other than what it is that they are studying in the lesson. The poem ends with the teacher reflecting on the stone-like quality of uh, her students' faces, where she is unable to understand uh, what degree of comprehension the students have actually experienced. Uh, the classroom, therefore, like the stone-faced student, is a place where a certain degree of incomprehension can take place. Uh, the poem thus presents a very cynical view of uh, the extent of learning or communication that is possible in a classroom. Adrienne Rich is a prominent uh, 20th century American poet. She was also a feminist and a thinker. Uh, although she is uh, well known for her poetry, uh, she also is uh, known to have served on the editorial board of various uh, prominent journals. Uh, she also taught several writing courses. Uh, in addition, uh, she was also a political activist. Among her famous uh, poetry collections are A Change of World, uh, Snapshots of a Daughter-in-Law, uh, as also Diving into the Wreck. In a Classroom, the poem that we are studying today was published in uh, 1989 as part of the collection uh, Time's Power. Rich's early work, which is A Change of World, uh, displayed her influence uh, of uh, W.B. Yeats and Robert Frost as also W.H. Auden. However, the style and content of Rich's work uh, was seen to mature into a very distinctive style as her uh, later collections came up. These later collections uh, displayed uh, her engagement with uh, themes like the role of women in society, uh, racism and the Vietnam War. And these were all uh, themes and issues that were gaining currency in the 60s in America. Therefore, not only engage with uh, uh, Rich's concerns with these themes, but uh, they also reflect a, a great sense of personal distress that she underwent during this period because her marriage with uh, the famous Harvard economist uh, Alfred Conrad came to an end in 1970. And uh, these themes thus uh, had a very profound influence on Rich's work. These were all, as we can see, personal experiences of distress. And Rich was able to find uh, cultural legitimacy for a very personal experience of distress, uh, owing to the fact that uh, civil rights movements and uh, feminist movements were gaining prominence in the 70s in America. Uh, therefore, she narrates her own personal experiences of being subjugated in a male-dominated world, of, uh, being, of having to juggle uh, dual roles of motherhood, uh, of uh, a socially prescribed notion of womanhood, as also a role of artistry on the other. And uh, the juggling of these roles uh, are a very personal um, experience that Rich is communicating. And by communicating this personal experience, she speaks for uh, all women and uh, marginalized people. Rich was involved in several social justice movements. Uh, amongst these was uh, having to teach in the Sikh program. Now, the Sikh program was uh, a program that was a remedial English program. It was meant to help uh, third world uh, students as well as underprivileged uh, students who were entering into college. And uh, Rich was involved with this program and uh, helped teach these students English. Uh, she also is known to have taught writing courses in various universities across America. And it's very possible that her experience with uh, teaching these uh, courses, teaching as part of Sikh, and having to communicate ideas of both uh, politics and artistry, it's possible that these experiences uh, find an outlet in the poem that we're studying today in a classroom. Uh, let's now move on to the poetry of the classroom. As promised earlier, we will also be studying in a classroom. 
uh, in the context of other classroom poetry or poetry that deals with uh, the classroom space. Now, riches in a classroom can be studied in a very useful contrast with uh, other poems which are also about the classroom or classroom poetry as such poems are called. Now, uh, these kinds of poems are variously engage with uh, ideas of knowledge, education, communication and learning. And uh, amongst the most well-known of these poems is W.B. Yeats's uh, Among School Children. In Among School Children, uh, Yeats uh, uses the space of the classroom or rather the narrator of the poem uses the space of the classroom to try and understand what part of one's education uh, is responsible for shaping one's character, life and destiny. Now, Yeats finds or the narrator finds that these students are learning history, they learn sewing and they learn hygiene. They're also introduced to the philosophies of uh, Plato and Aristotle. However, the uh, narrator realizes that these are all aspects or rather only subjects that these students are exposed to, which means that they have a distinct sense of a school education. But he feels that this school education is uh, distinct from the education that one gains uh, later in life or the life education that one gains as an adult. In another poem, uh, Vernon Scanner's uh, School Room on a Wet Afternoon, he speaks of the desires, pains and ecstasies that are in the students' mental shows. He uh, refers to the students' minds as their mental shows. And he talks about these uh, feelings of pain, anxiety, as well as desire that exists in these students' minds in addition to the lesson that is being instructed to them. Therefore, a schoolroom on a wet afternoon, like other uh, classroom poems, uh, is also concerned with uh, what kinds of uh, or what contexts of the student are permitted or allowed within a classroom. So while, uh, for instance, a school or, or a classroom may focus on the instilling of discipline, uh, be focus on uh, concentration on the lesson, uh, they simultaneously exclude uh, the cultural, emotional and material contexts and experiences of these students. Uh, because as Scannell says uh, in the poem, uh, despite the fact that the uh, school room uh, or classroom is uh, instilling a sense of discipline in the students or, or is instructing them in a lesson, uh, uh, for I mean, it, this is how it appears to an onlooker. However, if you look in, inside these students' desks, uh, what he says you find are um, a veiled rope and uh, blade and gun cocked to kill. Uh, here he is therefore referring to uh, perhaps the violence that is uh, very much a part of these students' lives, which is not something that is necessarily part of the curriculum that these uh, students are being educated in. Similarly, another poem that we can speak of in this context is uh, Stephen Spender's uh, An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum. Uh, in this poem, uh, Spender is looking at the kind of educational tools that are available in the uh, slum classroom and he contrasts these educational tools with uh, the actual lives of the slum children. Now, the slum children live in a certain degree of uh, dirt, squalor and poverty and their lives are without any hope. However, their classroom, uh, as Spender describes it, uh, very ironically has a, a picture of the world map, uh, for instance, and he says that this is supposed to be their window of opportunity into the world. However, these students uh, are very removed from this kind of reality or very removed from what it is that they are taught in uh, their well colonial structure of uh, school system. Another cl uh, classroom poem that would also be useful to look at in this regard is something called The Lesson, written by Roger McGough. Uh, the lesson is important because uh, it deals with the teacher-student hierarchy. Now, this is another very important aspect of uh, many classroom poems. The teacher-student hierarchy is something that many of these poems uh, both engage with and also attempt to dislocate. They question why it is that the teacher in, is invested with uh, this absolute uh, degree of authority. Uh, therefore, in the lesson, uh, through the use of irony and humor, the poet uh, describes a situation where uh, the teacher maintains decorum in the classroom by violently and brutally killing any student who doesn't listen to him or who has uh, an argument. At the end of the poem, we see that uh, the classroom is the site of a bloody massacre. There are only dead or dying bodies of students that lay there. And uh, the poet ends by reflecting that the lesson has been learned or rather the lesson has been taught that silence needs to be maintained. So it's at a very great cost that the teacher manages to uh, achieve silence in the classroom. And this is, of course, uh, dealt with a certain degree of irony, but it also communicates how uh, uh, there is an inherent violence involved in investing uh, uh, a large degree of authority in the teacher.
in a classroom. Talking of poetry, hauling the book's armful to the table where the heads bend or gaze upward, listening, reading aloud, talking of consonants, elision, caught in the how, oblivious of why. I look in your face, Jude, neither frowning nor nodding, opaque in the slant of dust motes over the table, a presence like a stone, if a stone were thinking. What I cannot say is me, for that I came. We will now move on to a discussion of uh, key themes and ideas uh, in, uh, in a classroom. Uh, Rich's uh, poem opens with an activity that uh, the narrator is engaged in, which is presumably that of speaking about the subject of uh, poetry. Uh, the narrator, who is perhaps a teacher of poetry, is seen to be weighed down uh, by her, uh, literally by the books that she is uh, or he is carrying. Because as I said before, the poem talks about her uh, or him hauling an armful of books. Now, uh, this is on a literal level. However, metaphorically, the poem also communicates how the teacher is weighed down by the burden of having to teach. And she is weighed down by uh, the knowledge that she has to yet impart to the students in front of her. This is, of course, indicated in the words used. Uh, if you pay careful attention to uh, hauling, hauling indicates expending of a great deal of effort. Uh, as also armful uh, would indicate activity that is in excess of one's capacity. Therefore, both of these uh, terms uh, build a sense of how burdensome this responsibility of teaching is for the narrator. We also get to see the students from the teacher's perspective uh, or the narrator's perspective. What the narrator sees in front of her are heads and uh, these heads uh, indicate the students that she sees and they are variously engaged in activities of reading, speaking aloud, uh, they are speaking of consonants and elision. She also uh, observes that these students are caught in the how and oblivious of why. Now, uh, consonants and elision, they are integral parts of any discussion of uh, poetry or any discussion of uh, the language of a text. Now, when they speak of consonants and elision, however, these students are only aware of uh, structural aspects of the language. They are uh, aware of the style of uh, the poem that they are perhaps reading. And therefore, they know how the, how the poem communicates uh, what it wishes to communicate. But as the teacher observe, observes, uh, they are unaware of why the poem uh, says what it does. And they are unaware of why perhaps the poem is created itself. Uh, the poem then moves on to describe one student in particular, uh, Jude, uh, as she refers to him. And his expression is compared to that of a stone. Uh, Jude is like a stone. He is opaque. Uh, cannot be read. Uh, he has no emotion on his face. The narrator, however, says here that a Jude appears as though uh, a stone would if a stone were thinking. Now, if a stone were thinking means that the narrator is here allowing for the possibility that Jude may perhaps be paying attention to her. Uh, what is important to note at this point about Jude's face and the fact that it is compared to a stone is that the teacher is um, one, unaware whether or not Jude has understood her. But by saying that he, he were like a stone if it were thinking, she is allowing for the possibility that though she may not know it, uh, Jude may have comprehended or understood a certain degree of what has been communicated to him. The poem ends by reflecting on the very limited role uh, that the teacher has in the classroom uh, by, uh, by saying, what I cannot say is me, for that I came. Uh, let's now move on to speaking about uh, bodies in the classroom or rather how bodies have been represented in the poem in a classroom. As we've uh, talked about already, uh, classroom poems make a comment on uh, the limited uh, nature of participation that students have in the classroom as also how certain contexts of the students' lives are excluded in the classroom, especially social, cultural and emotional contexts. Therefore, the reality of students' lives is very often excluded in the classroom space itself. Uh, in a classroom demonstrates this by eliding uh, bodies of uh, students as well as uh, of anyone in uh, the poem. Now, both the narrator and the students, if uh, you read the poem, uh, you will find that their uh, bodies have not been referred to in their entirety. So, for instance, the narrator or the teacher is only referred to at all in the poem as an arm. So, we only see her as an arm and we see the activity that he or she performs, which is the hauling of the books. Uh, the students similarly are only referred to as heads uh, and uh, when 
when we see these heads, we only see them from the narrator's perspective. We have no separate perspective of these students. Uh, we also uh, we also see them uh, through the narrator uh, as well as uh, hear them uh, through her description, which is that they are speaking aloud or that they are talking of consonants and elision as we spoke of. Now, uh, the poem uh, thus demonstrates how in a classroom setting uh, where there is expected to be a very easy, uncomplicated route or transference of learning, uh, there is actually only a very partial uh, degree of communication uh, that is possible. For instance, the role that the teacher and the student play, uh, the poem demonstrates, are only a symbolic one. Uh, these roles are what is performed in the poem uh, as uh, what is expected of uh, these performers. I'll make this clearer by saying uh, that the teacher, for instance, uh, performs, or the narrator, performs the activity that he or she is expected to perform, which is to bear the burden of tutoring or teaching. Uh, whereas the students, as we can see them, also similarly perform duties that are expected of them and that we would expect to see of them in the classroom, which is to uh, be reading uh, and uh, speaking and also appear to be engrossed in their lesson. Uh, the classroom that Rich describes, however, is, uh, is a space where there is a complete absence or an impossibility of communication or comprehension. Uh, this is evidenced, uh, as we have spoken about, um, through the eliding of bodies in the classroom. Uh, which therefore allows no possibility of comprehension or learning. Uh, and the last line, what I cannot say is me, for that I came, uh, makes clear the role of uh, the teacher that remains unfulfilled. So by saying that what I cannot say is me, for that I came, the teacher is, or the narrator has essentially made clear the fact that she has not been able to communicate what he or she came to communicate. She is unable to uh, express to the students the truth of her, about her own body. In addition, she also has no knowledge of what transpires uh, behind these stone-faced, uh, opaque uh, students. Uh, let's move on to uh, speaking about uh, how in a classroom dislocates the teacher-student hierarchy. As we have already spoken about earlier, uh, these, many of these classroom poems um, comment on how there is an undue degree of authority invested in the teacher itself. The first five lines of Inner Classroom, for instance, uh, shows us that the narrator has a very clear perspective of uh, what it is uh, that is taking place in front of her. She, for instance, uh, or he, is able to describe uh, the, the students as being engrossed in a certain activity and is also able to comment on this activity uh, and analyze it by saying that these students are uh, caught in the how and they're oblivious to why. Now, this indicates uh, a quite a degree of certainty uh, of understanding about uh, what the children are doing. Uh, moreover, uh, the teacher narrator is also able to uh, generalize the category of students. For instance, by referring to them all as heads, uh, we understand that the uh, students have all uh, been lumped together in this category of heads, uh, which means that they all have uh, a property that is something they share in common or a very general principle. But now, this description of certainty or this um, feeling of certainty uh, comes to a standstill when um, we reach the fifth uh, line of the poem, uh, where um, the teacher says that, I look in your face, Jude. Now, when the teacher looks in the face of Jude, uh, she realizes that uh, comprehension perhaps has not been completed or there is uh, here a student who may not have understood um, a large portion of what she may have said. Therefore, learning at this point uh, can flow from the teacher to the student and this is what uh, the poem uh, tries to demonstrate. Uh, in addition, as you would notice, uh, Jude has been described as a face, which is in stark contrast to uh, the other students who have all been uh, categorized as heads. So this is another possibility of learning uh, flowing uh, from the student to the teacher, because she has faced or uh, come against a category that uh, she is unable to explain, or she is faced with uh, a moment of indecision or uncertainty. Now, uh, Jude's face uh, paradoxically gives nothing away, and yet it may be one of uh, attentiveness. Uh, or, or of thought or emotion. Uh, it is after this encounter with Jude's face uh, that the teacher confesses to not being able to say what she or he came to say. Uh, therefore, it is after this point that uh, he or she is willing to admit that uh, learning perhaps does not only flow from the teacher to the student but can also happen the other way around. In addition, we have also spoken about the roles that the teacher and the student both play in the classroom. Uh, the teacher or narrator, uh, as she demonstrates, uh, plays the role of uh, bearing the burden of uh, tutoring and of speaking of poetry. 
and the students perform the role of being engrossed in their lesson. Uh, Jude's face uh, in the middle of both these roles is something that breaks uh, this uh, very well honed uh, uh, or a very well uh, worked out system of uh, teacher and student. Because in Jude's face, the teacher realizes that uh, it's only when both these roles are performed simultaneously, he or she can maintain uh, the authority that is invested uh, in the teacher role. Uh, by uh, looking at Jude's incomprehensible stone-like expression, uh, the teacher understands that uh, when one of these roles breaks down, automatically the authority that the teacher is invested in uh, is also uh, something that uh, will break down. Jude therefore uh, makes the teacher aware that these performances uh, or rather these roles that they play are merely uh, performances and they are merely symbolic and uh, they are not always, uh, they do not always result in uh, a totality of communication or comprehension. We can now move on to speaking about the language of uh, inner classroom. Uh, the language of the poem itself sets up several of the themes and issues that we have been speaking of. For instance, the language of the poem sets up the impossibility of communication theme that uh, we have been discussing. Because if you look at the poem, the first four lines of the poem employ active verbs like uh, hauling, listening and talking and therefore they indicate some form of ongoing action. All of this uh, ongoing action uh, that is set up in the first four lines of the poem comes to a standstill in the shortest uh, uh, line of the poem, line five, which is, I look in your face, Jude. Here, I, uh, the subject, is placed in stark opposition to the object of the sentence, which is Jude. And uh, Jude's face, as we have seen, is impassive and it betrays no emotion. It is like a stone. It therefore brings action itself to a halt. So, I look in your face, Jude, uh, indicates that all of the action that has been built up will now, you know, physically be obstructed by the stone like Jude. The language here, if you see, uh, also sets up uh, this uh, theme of uh, breaking the teacher-student hierarchy because every, uh, every degree of certainty that was built up in the first four lines about the student's activities and what they may or may not know is suddenly obstructed uh, by uh, Jude, who with his incomprehensible expression or stone-like face uh, mars the teacher's understanding and he also blocks uh, any possibility of communication after she has uh, discovered that perhaps there is one student who uh, may not uh, have understood what she's saying. The poem uses uh, synecdoche to uh, emphasize the partial presence of bodies in the classroom. Synecdoche is uh, when a part is used to signify a whole. Examples of this uh, we have perhaps already uh, covered when we spoke of the arm of the teacher. So for instance, the teacher's arm uh, is a part of the teacher that is used to represent the whole as also the heads of the students and Jude's face. Uh, these are all parts uh, or the use of synecdoche to signify the whole. And this use of synecdoche, of course, uh, performs the function of uh, yet again reiterating uh, that there is only a partial physical and mental presence that these students have uh, in the classroom at any point of time. The second part of the poem from line seven onwards uh, sets up a very steady decline or uh, fall uh, in action. So, and this is of course in contrast to the first uh, four lines of the poem. There are uh, several negative statements and conditional clauses that have been employed in this uh, second part of the poem. So negative uh, statements like uh, neither smiling uh, nor nodding, uh, I cannot say. Uh, these are statements that set up a certain degree of uncertainty or indeterminacy. The teacher narrator moreover has realized at this point that Jude's face is opaque and uh, she will be unable to read any expressions or emotions in his face. So at this point uh, then, uh, because communication and comprehension are demonstrated to have, uh, are shown to have ceased, uh, there is a sense of complete stillness uh, that overtakes the poem's language. Therefore, once we have spoken about Jude being like a stone, uh, the stone itself lends the same kind of stillness and stasis that is its own quality to the action of the poem itself. When the conditional clause finally appears, which is if a stone were thinking, it is perhaps the most uncertain line of the poem because finally you have an admission here from the teacher narrator that uh, there is a possibility of something that she has, uh, himself or herself is not able to understand. So in contrast to uh, how, uh, with what degree of certainty uh, he or she was able to predict 
or observe that students are unaware of other than what they learn in the classroom, that they are unaware of contexts and situations outside of it. Uh, he or she is here suddenly faced with a possibility where uh, someone may have understood or comprehended what you said and yet uh, it, it still mars your understanding because there are things that are outside your knowledge or outside of your, uh, outside of your domain of possibility of knowing. We can conclude by saying that uh, Rich's poem uh, look, takes a very cynical view of degree or extent of learning and communication that is possible uh, within the classroom space. <laughs>